any YouTube live viewers who have joined us. We have some technical difficulties here, but we should have it ironed out shortly. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to the Talk Right podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Stennett, and my co-host, Nick Sullivan, is with us tonight, as always. And Nick, why don't you uh, introduce our guests for this evening? Oh, by the way, that wasn't a technical problem. That was us just pretending to chatter away <laughs> while the audience populated. It, it worked so well. It's the new it techno babble the, thing. <laughs> it fooled the guest, uh, the, the, the co host here. I, I, I bought it completely. Um, today, we have uh, two folks from Kobo joining us. We have Tara Kremen, who is the senior manager for the author experience at Kobo Writing Life, otherwise known as KWL. And we have Joni D. Placido, who is with author in, oh, the author engagement specialist of Kobo Writing Live. That's who they are. Awesome. Welcome, ladies. Thanks for uh, having us. Tara, tell us a little bit about what you do with, uh, with Kobo to start things off. Sure. Um, I've actually since been promoted. I'm now the director of Kobo Writing Live. Um, so I'm just sort of running the English language side. Oh, thank you. Um, so kind of just making sure that Kobo Writing Life is the best, most user friendly, um, independent publishing platform that we can create. And while also finding new opportunities for authors to be able to sell their ebooks and their audiobooks, which I think we're going to talk a little bit more about. Excellent. Joni, uh, what do you do over at Kobo, or up at Kobo? Y'all are up, both up in Canada, right? Yeah, yes, that's correct, Toronto. Uh, so we're a very small team, so we all do a lot of different things. So I work on audio promotions. Um, I also work on library promotions. I do a lot of work with Kobo Plus, which is our subscription program here. Um, I also do a lot of working with authors directly, so answering questions, talking to them about their business, their sales, helping sales to grow, that kind of thing. Um, I do our newsletter, have a little bit, or I co-host our podcast, the Kobo Writing Live podcast, and yeah, lots of different things. Oh, great. I'm going to want to talk to you about Kobo, Kobo Plus, because I'm, I'm now wide, and uh, I definitely want to, I'm on Kobo Plus, but I'm not seeing any page reads, so. Maybe I'm not, <laughs> but we'll get into that later. Um, Nick, what uh, what's your first question? Uh, well, the, the first, I, as I warned our guests beforehand, I know very little about Kobo, so a lot of my questions will sound completely clueless and stupid, but uh, maybe some of the writers who are tuning in will appreciate me for asking them. Uh, one is simply, what is Kobo Writing Life, otherwise known as KWL? Sure. So Kobo is a digital retailer that focuses just on ebooks and audiobooks. Um, we have been around for 12 ish years, I think is the anniversary this year. Um, but we're basically, um, we have a global footprint in the um, digital reading world, um, thanks to our parent company, who is Rakuten. Um, so we have a lot of strategic partners around the world where we can, uh, we kind of partner with um, different booksellers, like brick and mortar stores, um, like the equivalent of Barnes and Noble and stuff in France, or in, um, we partner with some bookstores in Mexico and Australia and things like that. Um, so that's kind of Kobo's main business. Um, we also make um, e-readers and um, have um, our apps that are available on iOS and Android. Um, so Kobo Writing Life is the self-publishing um, platform that allows authors to get their books into the Kobo retail um, system, basically. Now you touched on just a couple of countries there, but I know that I'm getting sales in New Zealand, South Africa, Ireland, uh, oh, all yeah. over the world. And uh, so you're, you're a worldwide, uh, how many countries do you sell on? We say 190, but I also believe that that's like the number of countries there are in the world. So all, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> so everywhere eBooks are sold. Exactly. exactly. I'm just taking care of some last. Oh, okay. Minute. I'll pop in. I, I'm staying mute a lot because my dog is growling at every dogger that walks by. Uh, let me see. Oh, you mentioned your, your parent company, Rakuten, and I, I have to admit I'm sometimes confused as what is Kobo and what is Rakuten because 
sometimes find a way, which is a, 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 an aggregator of, of audiobooks, will sometimes tell us uh, that we're our book is on Rakuten. And then I thought, well, isn't that the same as Kobo? Or might your audiobook be on Kobo and Rakuten on different websites? Or would it ultimately all go through Kobo? Um, the, Rakuten is our parent company. So there is... Um, I think in Japan, because Rakuten is a Japanese company, so the, their site is called Just Rakuten, uh, whereas it's Rakuten Kobo everywhere else. So it might just have been because it's Rakuten Kobo, maybe they forgot the the other half. But um, Rakuten is just like this giant e-commerce, uh, not even e-commerce, they have their hands in everything, uh, which has really allowed us to have this global reach that we have. Um, so you might be familiar with what was formerly Ebates is now just Rakuten, which is the kind of cashback system um, where basically if you're shopping, you earn money straight up, which is pretty great. Um, and Rakuten also own Viber, which is a text messaging service. Um, they have various streaming services. There's, um, I think it's Vicky really focuses on Korean um, television. Um, and you might also be familiar with them for their recent endeavor into sports um, sponsorships. They are the sponsors of the Golden State Warriors in the NBA and of uh, FC Barcelona, the Spanish football team that has uh, Lionel Messi as their player. So you get to see Rakuten emblazoned every time he's he's out there performing. And how, how does Walmart play into it? Because when I sign into my Kobo account, I'm actually signing in through Walmart. Yeah, we we don't make it easy, <laughs> but no. So Walmart is our partnership. It, like I mentioned, that we have partnered with many brick and mortar stores and different, um, um, not just brick and mortar, but different like e-commerce stores. So um, it's the same with Walmart um, that we power their eBooks and their audiobooks. So that's why you um, and it's just Walmart in the states. So you being based there um, would be logging in through your Walmart account. Now, if uh... Let's say, for instance, that I don't have a Kobo e-reader. Can I read Kobo books on any other e-reader? Uh, yeah. Or yeah. is there an app for, like, for my laptop? Or Yeah, there's um, a desktop app that you can download for a computer. And then we also have apps that you can download on any sort of smartphone or tablet. Um, and one of the great things about the Kobo app is that it has audiobooks and ebooks all in one place. Um, so you don't have to go between two different apps or anything. So they're all together. So, um, yeah, you can download those for free in, uh, in the App Store or the Google Play Store, wherever you get your apps. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, that's 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 the way it should be, I'd say. Um, <laughs> well, since you're mentioning the audio and uh, the ebook, uh, uh, does Kobo, if someone's with uh, uh, Kobo Writing Life, do you have uh, print on demand for uh, paperbacks? We don't at the moment. I'm, I'm, Joni, I feel like I'm taking all the talking okay. as well. Feel free to jump in. <laughs> um, we don't at the moment, just because our focus is really on um, going into the audiobook market. Um, we really excel in the digital space. Um, so we haven't put um, any sort of effort into the print on demand at the moment. Um, but never say never. Um, but no, not right now. It's just ebooks and audiobooks and subscription reading. That's the focus. So... The, when I go to Walmart and I go to the book area, you wouldn't, I wouldn't find any Kobo books there. You know, but you might find a Kobo device. Oh, okay. And then I could buy an ebook exactly. right there in the store. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you work, uh, Joni, you work with a lot of, uh, I guess, narrators also. Or we don't work directly producers? with narrators. No, um, we have so we have an audiobook uh, direct upload within the platform, so people can upload their own audiobooks. But we don't have any say in the production. Authors are coming to us with already finished audiobooks and just uploading those finished files. Okay, all right. Well, uh, let me jump over here to YouTube. Yeah, we may have some questions coming in. Uh, so let me, let me ask about that last thing. The, is is anyone checking those files, or is, the the onus is completely on the uh, uh, the rights holder and what they're uploading? 
Um, it's very, it's very similar to publishing eBooks is that like um, with independent publishing, the onus is on the author and publisher to really produce the best file that they can. Um, but we are checking obviously for um, kind of, you know, anything that is, you know, copywritten or, or something like that. Um, but for the most part, no, we're not, we're not quality checking per se. Um, but it's really great the way that you can upload the, the audiobook files because you just drag and drop them and you can order the files and that actually creates the table of content. Um, but one thing that we have as well is that you can play them as they're uploading. So you can double check that you have the right file and everything. And, and it allows you really to um, check the quality of the content before it's even been published. And something we should say with regards to that is that our audio upload program is still in beta. It's still relatively new and there's still, um, we, we don't have it automatically enabled in the account. So if it's something that you're interested in, we review your account and then we enable it. So it's at the moment, we've got a relatively small number of audiobooks versus what we deal with with ebooks. Well, that leads me into the first question on uh, from our YouTube audience. Don Rich asks, and this might be a question that is just impossible to answer. How many titles or authors do you currently have? Oh, we couldn't count them. There's so many. <laughs> um, I imagine it's in the millions, at least, titles. Yes, yes. So Kobo has, I think we're over 6 million titles at the moment. Um, and then, yeah, some of the other figures are sort of confidential, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we can definitely say that a growing catalog of over 6 million titles of uh, ebooks and audiobooks. And if you were to break that down, uh, say by genre, what's the, well, of course I know romance is the biggest genre, but what are some of the other uh, high sales genres on Kobo? Uh, genre fiction typically does really well. So you said romance, um, sci-fi is a big one as well. Mysteries and thrillers also do really well. It tends to differ as well as it's such a global uh, reach that we have with the books that it can vary from country to country um, so it's sort of difficult to say um, one thing is um, overall more popular than the other and then of course when you think about um, I think we were thinking about ebooks there but if you think about audiobooks it's the genres are slightly different then as well about mm -hmm. what's popular and what's selling which is um, quite interesting for us to look at okay well now, let me I'll... ask about oh go ahead go ahead no you go ahead Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> what kind of tools do you have? Um, here's one of the, I'll give my own situation. Uh, I, I went all in with uh, Amazon and Audible, partly because I've been recording for Audible for so long. Um, but uh, I wanted to look at doing wide and I did choose to do one of my audiobooks wide. But the reason I chose to do it was because of the existence of Chirp. Uh, and one of the problems I see with a lot of folks that don't, you know, have someone dedicated helping them make it happen with wide is every single platform that you're trying to sell to may have different ways to get eyeballs. Uh, and the amount of work you would have to do across all of those things is so huge. Um, Chirp offered me a way to just go boom, here's a way that I'm going to get a lot of eyeballs. Does Kobo have a way to help someone that, that signs up with uh, KWL? to, you know, do you have versions of say um, uh, KDP's countdown deals? Do you have uh, ways that you can occasionally, uh, even if it costs you some money, but ways to get your book uh, out in, to the fore for, you know, a day at a time or a week at a time? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we work really closely with our audio merchandising team to run audio promotions. And typically they're genre promotions, but sometimes right now we're doing audiobook month. So it's all genres, all audiobooks, everything. Um, so the way that works at the moment, we don't charge authors for that because again, we're still fairly early in our audiobook journey. Um, but they're typically price drop promos. Sometimes we do buy more, save more. Um, so we ask authors to drop their prices for the duration of the sale. We normally offer, we send emails, um, there'll be a landing page. Um, we sometimes provide authors with social assets that they can share on their social media. So sometimes it'll be like an asset for the sale and there's a space for you to put your book cover um, so that they have some um, resources to promote the sale with as well. So we're doing a lot of that stuff and we're growing, we're doing more and more sales every month it feels like. That is a big plus. I mean, price control is one of the 
biggest topics of conversation among uh, audiobook producers and narrators. And we know how to do it. We know how to how to market. And but for some reason, certain people just won't let us. <laughs> yeah, when we created um, the audiobook platform, it was really important for us to give um, as much control to the authors as possible. Um, so for pricing, we let authors control the price in 16 currencies. So it's exactly the same as ebooks. Um, we also allow pre-orders with no um, date limitation. So you can set a pre-order as far ahead as you like. Um, I mean, obviously keep it realistic. So you want to entice a reader. Um, but yeah, we don't ask for exclusivity either. So we want to really make it easy for authors to kind of come to Kobo and not have to worry about stuff like that. Yeah, I saw the lack of exclusivity mentioned when I did a little research and I thought, well, that's big. Uh, and from what I could tell your eBooks, um, well, I imagine you, you probably have some version of, a, of the tiny little delivery fee that comes off based on the size of the file. Oh, you don't? So it's just flat out 70% if you're 299 and higher and 45%, is, is that correct? I don't know how uh, old that log was. For eBooks, it's 70% if you're 299 and higher and we have no upper price cap. So you can price as high as you like. And then it's 45% um, if it's under um, 299. And then for audiobooks, it's slightly different. Um, so if you're pricing above 299, it's 45%. And if it's below 299, it's 35%. And if it is a subscription redemption from like a, a token that somebody has been used to redeem the book, it's 32%. Um, so yeah, that's one of the reasons that we actually have, um, we do have a payment threshold of $50. Um, and the reason for this is because we don't charge the fees. Um, so we just kind of accumulate the funds and send them out that way. Um, because it just, it just makes more sense for us to, to pay the authors straight up everything they're earning. So when the, when the author or producer uploads the audio books, they set the price. Yeah. Yep. Whoa. 16 currencies. Okay. And if let's say you wanted to drop <laughs> something to ninety nine cents uh, in both uh, audio and ebook, uh, just for some special you're doing, mm -hmm. maybe you plan to throw a lot of money into Facebook ads. How how quickly? Uh, uh, timing is always something that I think KDP has problems with. Uh, so uh, it, how quickly uh, can you guarantee that the price will will be changed? I can answer this question. Oh, you schedule it, Nick. You schedule what day you want the price to drop and what day you want the price to go back up. Okay. Yeah. Could any, you schedule any it an hour from the time you push the button? <laughs> I think Does there's a, I think there's, you can't schedule it for the same day, right, Tara? Okay. No, I don't believe so. No. Um, but anytime you make a change to your book, the changes should be like whether it's like the price or uploading a new cover or changing some aspect of your metadata, um, the changes should be on site within 24 hours. It's usually a matter of hours. It depends how busy our system is in the queue. Um, but um, in terms of audiobooks, one thing that's really great is that um, we do it all in house. Um, so we publish at the same speed that the ebooks are being published. So we say within 24 to 72 hours, but honestly, more often than not, it is like definitely within 24, if not just a matter of hours of the book going up. Um, so yeah, we do get that feedback that the changes go through quite quickly um, for, for authors that use our systems. Yeah, with that BookBub feature deal I had last month, Nick, the price dropped exactly when it was supposed to on five different platforms in a how many countries did you say there were, Joni? 192? Yeah. My price dropped worldwide everywhere at exactly the same time and went back up everywhere at exactly the same time, except for Amazon. Well, the, Am Amazon is... took three days to change the price. No. <laughs> that was the only change. Uh, this is where we should point out uh, to, to viewers here that uh, – if you're self-pub, you you all know what the holy grail uh, book pub is. And if you are wide, which I'm not, so I'm just giving you good advice. If you're wide, your chances of getting a book pub are far, far greater than if you're just with Amazon. Yeah, they do seem to favor authors that are on multiple platforms. I'm, um, I'm betting two for two right now since I went wide. Oh, congrats. And, we uh, see um, in the we past, I'm. Uh, 26 out of maybe 300 
Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, they definitely prefer wine. No, we love BookBub. They tend to do really, really well on Kobo. We get a lot of sales through BookBub. Yeah, yeah, we drive a lot of traffic, especially if it's um like a, a free book bub, because that still is a really good marketing tool for indies. Um, and Joni, do you want to talk about the audiobooks that like in the results that we're seeing? With free audiobooks? Yeah. Yeah. So this is something kind of interesting because we had never considered that people would want to offer audiobooks for free because we know they're expensive to produce. They take a lot of work. Like nobody wants to give that away. But we found that some of the some of the bigger publishers that use KWL um were dropping their prices to free just the same way that you do with ebooks they'll offer the first in series three free so we saw they were doing that and at the moment because we know that free is the most searched term on the Kobo store we do have a page dedicated to free um, it's a promotion page that we update once a week um, and we have multiple genre, uh, multiple genre carousels um, and feature books so we decided why don't we add a free carousel here add a free featured book audiobook and see what happens. So we've added this feature or this carousel to the free page. And um, given that it's just an experiment and we're just looking for titles manually, it's, I think, what did you say? They've tripled in the last? It doubled, oh, doubled, doubled the okay. downloads uh, yeah. since we've kind of put it on that page because that is such a popular um, one with readers. So it's been really interesting for us to, like Joni said, it's something that we didn't think people would do with audio, but they are sort of testing it out. Yeah, and there's no, people don't need to keep their book free forever, right? If you want to do a, a feature for a week or whatever, we can give it some visibility on that page. We're getting a bunch of questions on YouTube. That's usually not the case. <laughs> we, I don't know how many. The writers, they want help. What, what's our audience count right now, Jordan? Mm -hmm. Well, while she's looking that up. Well, she's counting, right. so. <laughs> okay. Um, I have to get my dog. See, I deleted that comment because I have no idea what he was saying. Um, oh, dog. Yeah, she's needy. <laughs> oh, look at the face. Very cute. Oh, um, um, Don Rich asks about the uh, the delay in payment. Uh, I think with Kobo, it's on the 15th, around the 15th, mm -hmm. yeah. the month following. Yeah, exactly. It's 45 yeah. days after the end of the month when you yeah. hit the threshold of $50. So if you hit $50 in February, it'll be March 15th, 45 days after the end of February. No, so done in the same month as Amazon, but yeah, sorry, 15, that's right, 15 days earlier. <laughs> yes, yes. So Amazon but, is 60 days and we're 45. I, I'm, I, I have to admit, I didn't actually go wide. I hired my uh, publicity company and told them I want to go wide and they did all the work. So I, I have no idea what, <laughs> what's, what's involved. And that has been one of the biggest problems is trying to figure out who is paying when. <laughs> mm, I can yeah, imagine. I bet. A lot of retailers. Uh, I have a question here myself. When I looked up Kobo eBooks, one of the things I noticed is you have your own e-readers. And yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. What can you tell us about those? Well, we kind of pride ourselves in, in making some of the best e-readers in the market, um, we think. Um, we've been making e-readers since since Kobo began, really, and kind of innovating and always releasing at least two e-readers a year. Um, and just some of the ways that we're sort of um, changing things is that I was just talking about the, the latest device that we just announced is called the Kobo Ellipsa. Uh, which I have here um, because I was beta testing it, but it is something that allows you to take notes with a stylus. Um, so you can take regular notes, you can um, take notes that are written and then will convert automatically to text. Um, you can doodle, which I enjoy, um, but you can also uh, just mark up your EPUBs and write notes. And it's been something we've been developing for quite some time. So we're really excited about it to uh, finally come to market. Um, but there's a lot of thought that goes into them. And we actually design everything in house as well. So when we were in the office, um, it was always pretty interesting to go up to the second floor and you have like the e-reader designers and the product team and, and they're working out problems with like the ultimate problem that we're always trying to solve is, is making it as much of a, a print reading experience as possible. Um, we actually just interviewed um, the VP of product, um, Ramesh. Um, so we'll have a podcast episode coming out where he'll talk about the design that goes into this because we're using a whole new e-ink technology 
um, and everything, but it's, um, yeah, it's really interesting to see what goes into it. Um, Joni, do you want to tell them about the format a little bit? That's your, your favorite Kobo. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we have a variety of different e-readers. Tara's got like the fancy brand new one (laughs) there, the ellipsa that she's talking about. The one that I use the most is the Forma. So that's our kind of second biggest device. And I'm just going to show I have it here. And it has, it has buttons along the side, which I really like about it. And it also, yeah, it's like, it's a good size as well. Um, But it also, you can read it in landscape or portrait, which is another thing I like. Um, It's super, super light. And one of the other pluses for me is that it doesn't have glass behind the screen. So you can be somewhat abusive with it and it it won't break. I throw mine in my backpack all the time and I've dropped it quite a few times and... Yeah. No glass behind the screen. What what is it then? It's uh, plastic. It's a it's a specific type of plastic. Where oh, actually, wow. when the Forma was released, they they showed us all these testing that they do with bending the devices, and they actually dropped it off of the top of the Kobo building, the roof, like four stories, and it didn't smash. It was still working. Um, we don't recommend that you we do don't that. recommend <laughs> anyone does that. But just to just to show of how proud we were of it when it was launched. Uh, I don't know how many times I've dropped my e-reader getting in or out of the truck back when I was truck driving. And uh, it does some damage just falling six feet. (laughs) No, the technology has changed somewhat. And uh, the form is uh, waterproof as well. It is waterproof, yeah. Yeah, so we developed the world's first waterproof e-reader some years ago, the Aura H2O. Um, So we've been kind of adding it into our higher uh, higher. It's waterproof or water resistant? Waterproof. Uh, waterproof. You can give it you a can, good dunking. Mm-hmm. You can hold it underwater. Yep. Mm-hmm. You can read and swipe pages. So you can scuba dive and read at the same time. Nick. <laughs> if that's we something you want this. to do. There might be a depth yeah. that you can't do, but um again, there was a period in the office where there was just lots of Kobos in sinks and people testing them. <laughs> it was kind of funny. <laughs> Nick and I are both scuba divers, so and we're always looking for things to add to our bucket list. That's going to be one. We're going to, we're going to read a book underwater. <laughs> if we want to see a video of that, please. Yeah, you have to capture that and share it with us. So, uh, what's the what's the average price of the Kobo e-readers? Very varied. So our um, our kind of basic device is the Nia, and that one's around the hundred dollar mark. I believe it's ninety nine American dollars. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's then, like our entry level and then it goes up um i think the forma is almost like 300 300 and yeah. i think this is 400 450 i'm not too sure 400 it's not 400, 400 US. Okay. yeah and that one you can make notes uh actually now i have two questions the books that are published through kobo writing life epub is the format yeah but we accept many different formats and we'll convert to epub for free um, but we will publish it as an EPUB. But so EPUB um, is preferable if someone's getting formatted from the ground up. Exactly, exactly. So, and mo- most people already have an EPUB file if they're going somewhere else. Um, so yeah, we would definitely say EPUB. It's something that Kobo has always used because it's it's allowed us to have customers from different stores. So for instance, when Sony um, kind of sunsetted their um, digital reading um business uh, we were able to kind of um, take on their customers and keep them reading because we were able to fulfill the books because they were epubs and and sony devices can use kobo books one thing that it really interests me is this the being able to write and then it turns it into text yeah it's pretty now, for incredible s- for somebody on the, for a writer on the go i mean you, you stop at a stoplight pick up your e-reader and write the next paragraph and it's, sa- it's saved to your documents and you add it to your file later on. Yeah, so it's all, um, all your notes can be exported really easily um, th- to Dropbox or you could connect them to a computer and, and uh, export that way. Um, but yeah, it's super easy. I'm really excited to see what authors will use it for. I'm, I'm imagining it would be very helpful in the editing process um, because you can load PDFs as well and do any markups that you have to anything. Um, well, that was my question was if you, you had an EPUB and you made a mark on it, would you be able to yep. go in on your laptop, pull up and, and go in and make that change? Um, I believe thing. so. The markups um, maintain themselves. Um, uh, yeah, so I believe so. Because that's one of the things that the team were working on developing because um, with e-reading devices, 
um, and a lot of the books are reflowable, you know, they're fully customizable. So you can change the font and in turn that changes the amount of page numbers that are in a book. Um, so one thing that the team were working on for ages was that if they, you know, you circle a word and then you change the font, like how do we know that that word is the one that you still wanted to circle yeah. and mark up? So those are all captured um, through this uh, Kobo Ellipsa. And, and does that form uh, have a microphone? Would you, do you would have the possibility of speech to text? No, no, not yet, but maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> Uh, technology is just advancing so fast. <laughs> it's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, Don Rich asks um, about returns. Uh, what is uh, Kobo's return policy on both ebooks and audiobooks? Ah, uh, we, we are not the right people to ask that, actually. I don't know what our return policy is. Joni, do you know what it is for I, devices? I'm not sure, honestly. No. I know. Like we, we do them. Yeah. <laughs> just, I yeah, don't yeah. know what the rules are on. on I one. would say um, if he goes to help.kobo.com, I believe that's the site um, where the customer care team have a lot of information there. I'm pretty, I think we have a pretty um, straightforward return policy. Okay. Yeah, I, I suspect he's bringing that up because of the um, audible gate uh, where uh, oh, books right. were being returned even when they were finished and then all of the money was taken back from the narrator and nothing from Audible. Yeah, no, we, we, don't, have a, a, we don't have a process if like that returned, at all. If it's returned, you guys take the hit. Um, no, if it's returned, you do get authors that see returns on their, their sales reports from time to time. Uh -huh. um, you know, if somebody has accidentally bought the same book twice um hmm. that can happen if, if you're sending books to kobo from more than one place so say if you were using an aggregator and you come direct as well um but it would have to be like a valid reason for the return we're not just gonna have it return um like an audiobook you know something you've listened to and then didn't like um no yeah it would get flagged if we were doing a lot of those yeah good okay that's great news do we, do we have any non-Don Rich questions from the audience? Thanks, um, Don. <laughs> Don's doing most of the talking over there. <laughs> of course, Don does most of the talking everywhere he goes, I imagine. Uh, let's see. No, nope, we've got a couple of more people in there. Uh, Boyd Craven is in the house. Hey, how you doing, Boyd? And uh, Brick. Brick is in oh, the Brit house. Oh, Britnick. All right, come on, Nicholas Harvey. <laughs> My fellow scuba diver with a nickname that confuses everyone. Brit Nick will have a question because I've teased him now. So give him a few the, minutes. These guys are all part of the, the tropical authors community and uh, we're a quite lively bunch. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, So are there any plans for, for print on demand? Is that something I, I, I would think that authors deciding to go to come to Kobo for a soup to nuts alternative to, to KDP are going to be looking for a way to do uh, the paperbacks. Although I suppose they could go Ingram Spark for that and then come to you for, for all the E. Yeah, I think that's what we see the majority of authors doing. Um, Ingram has such a sort of foothold on, on the print on demand industry. Um, and this could definitely vary from place to place. Um, we did do a little trial in France with print on demand, but sort of decided not to continue with it. So um, yeah, like I said, never say never, but it's not something that's on our focus um, in the immediate. I'd say it kind of ties into us not having any exclusivity. Like our, uh, like our mission statement is really to serve readers and get authors work out to readers. And it's not necessarily about us cornering the market and getting all uh, getting everything. If you come to Kobo, we don't think we don't expect you to only be publishing at Kobo. We expect you to be selling your books in as many places as you can. And I think that's a really big part of that's one of the things I really love about Kobo is that it really is ultimately about making reading experiences really great. And then at the same time, making the experience for authors really great as well. I know my experience so far has been very, very good. Since that book, Bub, my read through on Kobo is I, I haven't calculated it yet. It's only been, let's see, it was on the 28th. So that's 10 days ago. And, but the read through on Kobo is I'm saying at least 40%. Oh, that's the, fantastic. The, the, it was the first book in the 20 book series. Oh, wow. So 40% read through. I'll take that. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. I mean, 
Kobo, my sales on Kobo almost paid for the ad. Nice. At 99 cents. It did really, really well. Uh, what sort of programs do you have uh, for uh, libraries uh, getting a hold of the ebooks? So we work very closely with Overdrive um, to distribute books from Kobo Writing Life to Overdrive. Um, it's very, very simple. When you upload a book in the rights and distribution section, there'll be a section to opt into libraries. So you tick a box and then you have to set a price. So your library price is going to be a little bit different to your retail price. We typically recommend that it's higher because the library generally buys the book once and then can loan it out multiple times. Um, so yeah, it's very, very simple. Then once you've opted in, the book becomes available in Overdrive's catalog and libraries can see it and purchase it for their branches. And we also recently, I should mention, um, as well as the purchasing ones and then being able to loan out forever, we also have an option for librarians to purchase the book at 10% of the library price for one loan only. So if somebody asks for a book, the library doesn't know the author, maybe isn't sure about it, they can say, okay, well, we'll do it for this one reader. And then maybe if they get lots of requests, that's when they'll buy the book and have it in their catalog permanently. I had a sale in Palm Beach County, or not Palm Beach County. What's the next one north of there? No, it, yeah, it was Palm Beach County. Uh, to the Palm Beach County Library on Kobo just last nice. week. The librarians are the ones that you want to attract as well, because uh, they're the ones that are talking to people and word of mouth still sells books. So I feel like the librarians are really um, the key people for that. I've never had access to libraries before because libraries and Amazon are like oil and water. They, they just librarians do not like Amazon for whatever reason. And now that I'm wide, I'm, I'm getting a lot of library sales. Uh, most of them are coming through draft to digital through overdrive, but I'm seeing one or two here on Kobo every now and then. And that's really cool. How can, how can an author, is there some, some, uh, melting pot where authors and librarians get together online. <laughs> I don't, I don't there know what should to... be. There should um, be for yeah. sure. <laughs> no, not really. One of the kind of nice things about library books is that it is almost kind of organic. It really is, as Tara mentioned. It, it is word of mouth. It's readers requesting books, and it's not about how much money you've spent on advertising. It's you know, there's a little bit of that with book selling in general, but I think most of it really is word of mouth and people genuinely loving your book because the library. That's all they're there for. They're just there to connect readers and books. Yeah, I think I think with advertising, it's advertising is always very specific. Mm -hmm. If I'm advertising on Facebook, I'm advertising to Kobo audiences or to Apple audiences or whoever, and the link is always very specific to that retailer. But word of mouth, like in the library, that's that's the only way that library libraries get advertised. And library readers are voracious as well. Like they want to read a lot. They're passionate about books, right? So those are the readers that you really want looking. Um, yeah, Joni does run some uh, library promotions too um, as well, where we kind of have specific genres and kind of like have a, a bundle of books to offer to librarians. Um, yeah, I totally what? forgot to tell you about these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the library, the library, um, runs promos and we also we participate in the promos the library runs but we also sometimes do our own so if an author wants to promote their their backlist maybe to a library or they want to push one series like we'll ask overdrive to feature them in their internal library communication email so it's a sale that only goes out to librarians it only affects library prices and it just gives um, librarians a little bit more of an opportunity to see your books oh i want to do that Okay, well, I definitely want to do that. Let me know. <laughs> I'll add you. I'll add you to that uh, list of people. Britnick like asks a question that goes right hand in hand with that. Does Kobo offer any kind of promotion outside of being in a BookBub ad or a Chirp? Are there promotions internal for yep. eBooks? Yeah. So within the dashboard, we have a promotions tab, and again. Like the um, audiobooks tab, it's not active in all accounts. It's only available in English right now. So we have to manually enable it. Um, but authors can email us at writinglifeatcobo.com and we can enable the promo tab and we update it weekly. It has a variety of promotions. We have a lot of free promotions available on that free page that I mentioned earlier. Um, we have some price drop promos. We also do promo code promotions, which people really like because they 
the book remains at full price and then readers use a promote a promotion code to drop the price so they don't have to worry about price matching on other retailers and they don't have to worry about manually dropping prices either or scheduling price drops um we also do some buy more save more sales so there's lots going on lots of opportunities yeah i would say if you don't see audiobooks or promotions in your Kobo writing life account um email us and ask and then just have a little little browse through what's available because um yeah we have lots of stuff constantly on the go all right don rich asks a really interesting question uh are you seeing more traditionally published authors coming aboard Kobo? Through Kobo, Kobo Writing Life? Yeah. Um, yes. It's, yeah. it's kind I mean, of an traditional publishing houses are, are, are uploading to Kobo as well as? It's, it's more. Well, yeah, that's, that's, of yeah we, we have <laughs> some, some imprints for sure, or not even imprints, but like, I guess imprints is the right word, um, mm -hmm. that would use the self-publishing tools that would use Kobo Writing Life um, to, to get published onto Kobo, because sometimes it's easier. Um, you know, the interface is a lot more user-friendly. You don't have to deal with like uploading Onyx and like metadata files and stuff. It's just, it's a lot easier. It's easier to see your sales. Um, but what I think is the interesting transition that we're seeing is authors that are traditionally published selecting like a certain series that they'll go wide with and they'll use Kobo Writing Life. So, um, yeah, we, we, we sometimes see um, people that we'd be surprised that are using our system and then they pop up. So, um, yeah. And then you occasionally see traditional authors who have um, gotten their digital rights back and are maybe able to publish it themselves and they want to try doing it that way. So we see a little bit of that too. Uh, let me ask if, if someone has something wide, an audio, only talking about audio here, and uh, it's wide and they've got it through Findaway, does that, since Findaway distributes to Kobo, does that eliminate the ability to uh, upload that book to KWL? Yeah, so we don't want duplicates on the store. So we would ask that they, if they want to come direct to Kobo Writing Life, we would ask that they delist from Find Away and then re-upload the book through Kobo Writing Life. Gotcha. But that's possible? Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you'd be able to do a lot more if you did that. Okay. Yep. <laughs> We're getting some great ideas here now. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> going to do that. <laughs> Sorry, Find Away. Oh, oh, Nick Harvey, one thing you missed, because you, you're late coming to the show. The Kobo e-reader works underwater, so Nick and I are going to scuba dive and read a book. Yeah, we this I think it's we, our we got list. ourselves a little. Yeah, maybe just thirty feet. Let's do a shallow reef or snorkeling. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll start with that. A hundred dollar e-reader. You don't want to ruin that. <laughs> well, well Joni, you'll have to. You can take it sailing. So if you fall in from your sailboat, you can do a, a matching matching water e-reading event. Yeah, I mean, if I fall in, I'm not worrying about where the e-reader is. <laughs> <That's fair enough. laughs> I'll jump off in a controlled way. Uh, I'll agree with that. <laughs> what do you sail? I've been sailing albacores and lasers. So little oh, wow. dinghies. Yeah. <laughs> Had uh, my first uh, my first trip of the year out yesterday and fell in twice. So it was a good baptism of fire. <laughs> I've got two racing sunfish that are just aching oh, cool. to get in the water. Yeah, you got to do that. All right, let me look over here for some more questions. I am out of questions, I think. I, I have a note here that Kobo is huge in Canada, so I'll just ask that. Somebody told me once, I, I was saying, boy, it's I hate that Amazon doesn't let me do countdowns in Canada, and I have people in Canada, and they have trouble doing stuff in Canada. And someone said, well, they should, that's because they use Kobo. Uh, is, is Kobo inordinately large in, in Canada or is that just sort of our perception of it? No, oh, yeah. Most of our readers are in Canada. I think because it's a local and it's a smaller, um, smaller company and it's local. So a lot of Canadians support Kobo. It's our home turf. So it was um, founded in Toronto where Joni and I both are. Um, so yeah, and I think we sort of got to market first for digital reading, um, kind of partnering with uh, a huge uh, brick and mortar um, store here, uh, Chapters Indigo. Um, so we'd be very, very well known to people in Canada would just equate Kobo's with being the word for e-readers. Mm -hmm. We have a lot I of can, really lovely- I can community. attest to that. My uh, marketplace share, Canada is probably 75%. 
of my total Kobo sales. Uh-huh. And my Kobo sales in Canada are higher than my uh, Canadian sales on Amazon. Hmm. Yeah. So, the, it, I mean, going wide is, is if you want to reach an international audience, especially 192 countries, and if you can do all the translations to, I mean, 192 countries, that's probably 400 different languages. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah you, could, you could corner the market. But that's- I will say it's surprising how often people will read, like read voraciously in English. For example, in the Netherlands, that's another one of our biggest markets. And it's not mm-hmm. Dutch books. It's people reading in English. So you'd be yeah. surprised at how well your English books will do. Yeah, Netherlands and Germany are number three and four after Canada and the U.S. Yes. And, uh, and South Africa, just South Africa is exploding. New Zealand and Australia. And- yeah, people forget, I think, that um, people adopt digital reading at different times. So in North America, it's sort of matured, but there's some places in the world where it's a new thing that people are just kind of coming to. And we definitely saw an acceleration of that um, this past year and a bit as m- more and more people were at home. Um, so I definitely think that if you're, you know, thinking about publishing wide to think beyond just your home area and to think about things globally. Well, here's a question since, since, since we're talking about languages and such, and I've, I've noticed that as well, the, the, the German and, and Dutch uh, speaking countries tend to read the English. Uh, whereas I think if you want to sell in France, you might want to consider translating into French. Um, and being that you're in Canada with, with your two languages up there, do you have a lot of authors that, uh, that take the step to, to translate into, uh, well, I would think French and Spanish would be the two that would make the most sense to me. Yeah. But it's um, an expensive prospect. It is. it is. It's it, it's the same as creating an audiobook, really, if you're wanting a good translation. I think they're quite similar in terms of like pricing and, and effort involved and, you know, trying to find your good narrator is like trying to find a good translator as well. Um, but we definitely see um, authors doing well with translations. Um, we have a few um, American authors that sell more in French than they do in English um, between really? like selling in France directly and then also our Quebec readership in Canada. Um, but yeah, definitely I would say French is is um, really, really popular on Kobo. Brit Nick had a great idea, Nick. Take a reef map on the e-reader when we do the dive. Oh, right. Oh. I mean, you can use that to find, yeah. Your way. Oh, yeah, yeah. to find your way to the different parts of the reef and everything. That, now, that is the be... stylus one, does that work underwater? No. Oh, shucks. You could <laughs> write down, I saw this here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I am, I'm still out of, out of I, I'm out of questions, Wayne. You got you to get some more. <laughs> Come on, writers. We know you're listening. Well, Don Rich asked about uh, anything similar to a countdown deal, and I, I explained that to him in the chat. Well, that, yeah, that YouTube. promo tab is one mm-hmm. of the reasons I'm asking about maybe talking to find a way, pulling it from Kobo only and coming to you directly because the ability well, can't you, to can't run. You, can't you do that through find a way? Tell them that you want to run a promo? So the thing with find a way is that they, they are considered a publisher. So we'd, we'd be working with find a way um, and Whereas this way you'd be working with us directly. So if you have them on find a way, like you would have to talk to them about promotions, but we on Cobra writing life are talking to authors directly. So. But I could go to find a way and say, Hey, I don't want you to just to distribute to Kobo anymore. Yeah. Why Nick? Oh, I have my own reasons. (laughs) No reason. Come to you and then. (laughs) Well, they're going to know the reason. (laughs) This June is audiobook month. Find a way came to me and offered me a thing to go to Nook, which my answer was, that's still around, and Apple and Google audiobooks. And I was curious why Kobo wasn't a part of that, but they said, well, they're they're not. And so now I'm thinking, well, they should be. I'd Maybe like to be in Maybe because it's still in beta. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. The, and we're, yeah, and we're doing our, I don't can know. can just come direct, I think, to take part of the, part of any promos that we have. Any idea on when uh, the beta testing will end and it'll be open to everybody um we're working on our new dashboard at the moment so it's what we'll work on after that so hopefully soon but um 
as with anything in development, dates always change. So um, I'd be hesitant to say a specific date for fear we wouldn't meet it, but soon. Yeah, nothing like a deadline to get people working. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Um, I guess one thing that we haven't touched on so far this hour is um, Kobo Plus, which is Kobo's subscription yes, program. Yes, I meant to ask you about that. Yeah. Yeah. So we launched this in 2017, um, specifically just in Belgium and the Netherlands, um, because we have a great partner there, Ball.com, and they were interested in, in um, creating a subscription program for their readers. And we were watching it and, and it did tremendously well. So then last summer we've launched in Canada, um, which was a big deal being our home turf. Um, we kind of uh, wanted to see if we could access this new subscription audience. Um, and it's definitely been something that it's gone really well so far. Um, it's like a new readership. Um, what Joni will be able to speak of a little bit is that um, it's not the same books that are like the top read books that are the top sold books, which is quite interesting to us because it sort of just indicates that they're different people. Um, and then our latest area with Kobo Plus that we just launched um, a few weeks ago was in Portugal. Um, and that was sort of a unique launch because we launched it with a publisher directly called um, Leia. Um, so we partnered with them to create, um, to make their books available and Kobo Writing Life books available and everything to uh, the Portuguese audience. Cool. And how is how, Kobo is different from uh, Kindle Unlimited? Kindle Unlimited yeah. is paid per page read mm -hmm. and Kobo is by, by the borrow or by? It's um, actually by minute. So we calculate how long somebody is reading a book. Um, and this lets us treat ebooks and audiobooks in the same way. Um, when it comes to subscription. So um, it's by the time that a person is taking uh, to read the book. And one of, the, yeah, one of the main differences too is that there's no exclusivity. Um, you can hop in and out whenever you like. I mean, obviously we'd encourage you to keep your books in to, to keep the readership there. Um, but you can also select the territory specifically that you want to put your books in. So um, we're all about giving as much power to the authors as possible to try, to try out these um, these Absolutely. New and I'll say one of the things I really like about it is that it, it, it rewards how long readers are spending engaging with the book. So if they reread your book, like you're getting paid for those rereads as well. Um, if they're spending more time on it, if it's one of their favorite books and, you know, that kind of thing. And it also, it means like if an author is, I think it's really good for backlist titles. Like mm -hmm. if an author somebody reads a book that by an author they've never heard of and they think, well, it's in Kobo Plus, like I'll add it to my device, give it a try. And then they fall in love with that author's writing, read their entire backlist, recommend it. Like it's a really, really good way. It's a great, great discovery device. That's, they, so you, you can get paid twice if they read it twice. If they yeah. read it twice. <laughs> oh. So it's like every, every minute your book is being read. So even if they've finished it and started again, um, yeah, we'll be calculating that again because it's all accumulated. I've had a number of readers tell me that they've read my series more than once. And that's, I'm talking 20 books. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah so. That would be awesome. And is there a reason why somebody wouldn't go into a certain market? Well, I'd say it's really just authors want to have their own goals, right? And they want to, have control over their books so I, like I personally think it's a great program and that you should at least give it a try but we also very much respect that you're self-publishing because you want to maintain control over your work and it's your work and you should feel good about the way that you're selling it so I, I think, think you should give it a try yeah I think subscription can be a scary word for authors because um it's perceived to devalue your book where in fact I really don't think it does um, because like we we're saying that there's a totally different um, readership there so it's just opening the door to new people let me get let me give you a, a, a thing I can't remember what the word is um, suppose a book an audio book is 10 hours long mm -hmm. that means that the average reader could read it read the ebook in 10 hours if somebody read my 10 hour ebook, what would it, what would the pay be in, in Kobo plus? So it depends it on, so the amount that we pay per minute read depends on that month. So it depends on how many people are subscribed and how many books oh, okay. are being read that month. So it is dynamic. It changes. It doesn't change a lot. Like it's always going to be within the same kind of range, but um it's it is dynamic so we never know until the end of the month how much one so there's a, a price price per minute that's yeah. the that value, per minute. value yeah. per minute yeah and what's what's the what's that range 
I'm trying um, to, I know I'm did, putting you on the spot here, but <laughs> this is, this, these are things that our, our audience know. is going to want to know. Yeah. yeah. It differs in territory because there's different value in the different territories. Um, but I would say, I think it's around one cent per minute at the moment. Um, but authors can see it on their sales reports. It's, it's quite, um, quite clear oh, there. That would be $6 for a 10 hour book. That, that would, it, it would have, no, it couldn't be that, but it couldn't be that high, could it? Cause that I would, think, that would yeah. pay the author more than if the book was purchased. Oh, the author cut would be 60%. That's oh, okay. the royalty. So, yeah. It's $3.60. That's about right. Okay, that's 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 really good. Very you're good. Ma I'm very impressed at how quick you're doing that math. So am I. I. <laughs> that's that's my forte. I'm I'm a math guy. Oh, <laughs> Joni and I were just like numbers. No. <laughs> <laughs> there there are a lot of people who are right brain thinkers and a lot of people who are left brain thinkers and they can't cross over. I, I wade in and out of them constantly. I, I'm a big data data freak. I, I'd I say most of our authors are the same as you. I keep spreadsheets on top of spreadsheets. Some of my spreadsheets are have 10,000 calculations. Wow. But it keeps me right on track with everything that's going on in my book sales. Well, we are almost to the bottom of the hour. Wow, that went by really fast. Yeah. I was wondering if we were going to have enough to say. <laughs> do, do we have any more of our YouTube audience with any questions? Let's see here. Um, oh, that's a, that's a great question, Don. Uh, in Kobo, Kobo Plus, uh, how many books can be borrowed at one time? Is there a limit on the uh, number of downloads before they have to return something? Is there a limit? I don't know the answer to that, actually. I don't believe so because even if it's downloaded and they're not in Kobo Plus anymore, that book can still be read. Um, it can still be accessed and you'll still get paid for it. So um, sometimes because we're like calculating all the minutes together. So some people might have opted their books out and then receive a sales report being like, how is this in Kobo Plus? But it just means that somebody at a later date is now reading the book. Oh, I, I, I get page reads on Kindle Unlimited for the first edition of my first book, which has been out and it hasn't been available for over two years, oh, wow. <laughs> it's, it's, it still gets page reads every now and then. The other thing is when people's e-readers are, when they've got the Wi-Fi turned off, then when they turn it back on, all the time they spent reading on Kobo Plus will then be added. Mm -hmm. So you could have a week with no income and then all of a sudden, boom, a whole bunch of money falls in. <laughs> yeah. I like, sort of. I like money falling out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we are out of time. Uh, it's been great having y'all on the show. Uh, I've, I've learned a whole lot and I have a lot of information to pass on to my publicity company, uh, who is one of our sponsors, Aurora Publicity. And I'd also like to thank uh, um, my publisher, of course, Down Island Press, uh, Pirate Radio for the cruising lifestyle. Joni, you need to download the Pirate Radio app. You'll love it. And uh, that's it, I guess, until next month. And we don't even know who our guest is going to be next month, do we, Nick? I guess we don't. We, we, we have about three possibilities, so we'll just leave we'll it up in the air. Throw, throw, them, throw those three possibilities out there I just and we'll see what remember that we is. have three possibilities. I don't oh, remember. Oh, you don't remember who they are. <laughs> no, I've got it written down here somewhere. Uh, several months ago, we, we were booked three or four months in advance, and that, I thought that was great, and then we didn't do anything for a while. And now we have an empty spot next month. Oh, so anybody <laughs> watching, if there's something that you really want to see, some some guest or a group of guests, or maybe we'll just get the whole tropical author community together and do something like that. A big Brady Bunch scene with 15 people. <laughs> on so anyway, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Tara and Joni. And uh, it's been a it's been a real eye opening experience, and uh, I hope everybody got a, a lot of information out of it. And we will see you next month. Thanks, Wayne. Looking forward to seeing.